The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Being skeptical is healthy and fuels a lot of productive scientific inquiry. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. As we've seen from earlier conversations this week, it can also drive dubious claims. Tonight, how politics across the political spectrum can lead us down such a path. There has been a long time anti-science movement in right-wing ideology, but what about on the left? In this conversation from 2013, we asked if political ideology plays a role in the types of science biases you hold. There are several references to the Tea Party, which was a right-wing contingent within the Republican Party at the time, that many believe helped set the stage for Donald Trump winning the election in 2016. Issues discussed by the panel, such as GMOs, genetically modified organisms, are still being debated today. And amid COVID-19, the question of vaccine hesitancy in particular has become an urgent issue. Since this aired, Michael Shermer has written five more books. Mark Linus is still an environmental activist and has written three books. And Chris Mooney now writes for the Washington Post and won a Pulitzer Prize in 2020. Here's that conversation. Vaccines cause autism. Wind energy is causing cancer. Right-wing wackos? Well, our next guest says these sentiments are alive and well on the left as well. Joining us now in Los Angeles, California, here's Michael Shermer. He's publisher of Skeptic Magazine and a columnist for Scientific American. Michael, it's good to welcome you to the program, and in doing so, I want to just start by reading an excerpt of something from a publication called Science Left Behind, written by Alex Barazzo and Hank Campbell, and it goes like this. By the modern era, super-rationalist progressives who once had held an almost religious belief in the power of science to create a utopian future had now largely left science behind. Lacking an emphasis on objective fact and focused primarily on legislating ideology and fighting anything that disagreed with cherished ideas, progressives became, as we know them today, unscientific, while claiming the mantle of modernity, denizens of a world where science is replaced by feel-good fallacies. Let's get into this. How exactly are progressives, or those on the left, unscientific in their ideology? Right. Well, um, first of all, I wrote that column based on that book in Scientific American, uh, largely because uh, for the past 10 years or so, I've been pounding run Republicans pretty, pretty hard on their anti-science attitudes, particularly uh, against the theory of evolution and, and global warming. Uh, and I got a lot of mail, you know, saying, hey, what about, you know, people on the other side? They can be anti-scientific. So people were sending me lots of examples. And when I saw this book, I thought, yeah, I should try to be a little fair here and, you know, dish it out to the other side as well, because nobody has a monopoly on truth and nobody's free of political bias for sure, including myself. So it's good to, I think, to sort of spread the skepticism around. And in, in particular, uh, I would agree with that sentiment you just read there from the book and uh, and just sort of look at the larger picture that, like, um, in, in that very issue of um, evolution, for example, there, there are, of course, creationists on the one side, on the Republican side, who don't believe in evolution at all. Um, and, but on the other side, there's what I call cognitive creationists, that is, people who don't believe that evolution applies from the neck up. That is, they pretty much uh, think that the mind is a blank slate, almost entirely um, constructed by culture, by the environment. And, uh, and this is simply not true. These evolution wars about the mind have been fought out over the last 20 years. In fact, it was over uh, almost a century and a half since Darwin published The Origin of Species that it was actually acceptable to claim that the human brain evolved just like the rest of the human body and that the, and the brain as an organ is like any other organ in the body. It evolved for a particular purpose to solve problems in the ancestral environment. That was controversial all the way up until just recently. In fact, it's still kind of controversial. So that idea, the blank slate, I consider that to be largely an anti-science attitude and that attitude is almost entirely uh, held by people on the left. Um, now, I want to make another important point that um, when people attack 
Republicans, really what they're attacking is people on the far right, because most Republicans accept most of science. It's the extremists on the right. And on the left, most people on the left accept most of science. So what we're mostly talking about here is the extreme left, left or what are called progressives, roughly speaking. Uh, so I think it's good to identify that because, in fact, as I showed in my column, uh, you know, 41% of Democrats don't accept evolution. So, and 19% almost, this is a recent Gallup poll, 19% of Democrats um, don't accept global warming as real and caused by humans. That's almost one out of five. So if, if liberals are the so-called people of the science book, you know, those numbers are not especially encouraging. So I think it's, it's good to be fair to look at the political bias on both the left and the right. We have, fair enough, and we actually have a chart which emphasizes a little more about what you just said. And Control Room, let's uh, bring this up if we can. These are the views of, as you can see, we've broken them into four different groups. Members of the general public, Democrats, Republicans, and then the Tea Party, that extra special feature of American political life these days. And here are their reviews as reflected by the red and blue bars on climate change and evolution. And you can see members of the general public, 69% believe the earth is getting warmer, only 57% believing humans have evolved. 81% of Democrats say earth is getting warmer, 64% say humans have evolved. 49% of Republicans, showing the skepticism on climate change here, believe the earth is getting warmer, only 45% believe in evolution. And among Tea Party types, only 41% believe that the Earth is getting warmer, and 43% believe in evolution. Uh, you see the source at the bottom of the graphic there. So I appreciate your, your desire to sort of be an equal opportunity um, chastiser, if you like, of those who skeptic. are... Uh, yeah, <laughs> skeptic. Okay, that's the better word to use, uh, picking up on the name of the magazine. But let's, let's use a couple of other examples if we can. We talked about vac vaccines causing autism off the top. We talked about wind farms causing cancer. These are some of the things we hear nowadays. Uh, give us some other examples of that fringe on the progressive left uh, whom you find to be as anti-science as that fringe on the far right, if you will. Right, like the following movements uh, are largely led by people on the left or the far left, progressives say, anti-vaccination, anti-fluoridation, anti-nuclear, anti-coal, anti-natural gas, anti-hydroelectric, anti-wind, and anti-GMOs or genetically modified organisms. Now again, not everybody on the left, just again, these ex extreme left progressives who seem to have more interest in a political agenda that has to do more with you know, like returning the earth or returning humanity to a natural state of things in which you really have to deny a certain amount of science uh, showing that these things are actually not as bad as, as what people on the extreme left think they are. For example, the anti-vaccination uh, movement, uh, almost nobody on the right uh, championed that. That was almost entirely a, a, a far left uh, movement. The anti-fluoridation, uh, same thing. Uh, I almost, I've met almost no, I haven't met a single Republican who agrees with that. Uh, coal, of course coal is, is bad for the air, but what are our alternatives? Well, okay, so wind. Oh no, wind is bad because the blades kill birds. Okay, what about natural gas? Oh no, natural gas is bad because it also contributes in a smaller way than coal, but still to global Global warming. Well, what about hydroelectric dams? Oh no, those are bad because they mess up uh, rivers and lake ecosystems. That's true. Uh, and and what about nuclear? Well, because of the nuclear waste and so on. So the the, the question is it becomes okay if you could marshal data to show all those things are bad. Well, then what are we supposed to do? Well, on the very far left, of course, the answer is we should have far less people. But um, and, and that actually is happening. But we're never going back to a globe with say 10 million people. You know, we have 7 billion. We're not going back. We may go back down to 6 or 5 billion by say 2150 or 2200, but we're never going back to 10 million where we can all live off the land and uh, and so forth. And so uh, I find those attitudes, I don't know what you want to call them, anti-science or anti-progress or anti-human. They're anti-something and they're almost always led by people on the far left. So is part of the point you're trying to make today that it is the far right is getting a bit of a bad break from mainstream media because we tend to focus on, I want to be careful what word I use here, but you know, you hear this expression about the loony left all the time and then, you know, whatever the equivalent is on the right. Do we have to make sure that we shed equal disdain for the far left as the far right? 
<laughs> I don't think we need to be disdainful on either side. I think it's important to pull back and take a bigger picture look at why people believe what they believe. I and mean, this is what I do for a living. I, you know, I wrote a book called Why People Believe Weird Things. I mean, this is what I do. Why do people believe this or that? And, and they have reasons. Uh, and we have this sort of moralization gap between the people that agree with us, who we think are the good guys, the moral people, and the people that are on the other team, the other side, uh, the other tribe that we disagree with, and, and they are bad, they're evil. And uh, both sides do this, we all do this, and uh, it's hard not to do that. And so this is why I like, and I've cited many times, Jonathan Haidt's uh, research, I think you've had Jonathan on the show before, mm -hmm. on uh, looking at the five moral foundations and how liberals and conservatives differ on to what extent they emphasize these five different moral dimensions. And it's not that the right is always left, or the right is always wrong, and the left is always right, or <laughs> sort of a funny way to put it, but um, it's that they emphasize different things. I mean, so um, the right tends to emphasize things like rule of law, you know, na nationalism, national pride, family, um, you know, group cohesiveness, you know, obedience to authority to a certain extent. Under certain conditions, those are all good things. Under other conditions, they may not be so good. It depends on the context. And the left emphasizes more these uh, moral values of the protection of individuals, the, the you know, harm care, that we take care of people that can't take care of themselves, we make sure people are not harmed, and so forth. Those are also good moral values that many people on the right embrace, but they often don't embrace them to the extent that they embrace those other moral values having to do with, say, group cohesiveness or the rule of law. And so again, there's this constant tension. And in my latest book, The Believing Brain, I actually conclude that it's possible because of our human nature, in which we have all five of these moral dimensions, that we will always have something like a two-party system, or at least a cluster of a bunch of parties that cluster toward the left and the right, in which you have this sort of tension, uh, in which you have one, one side that wants change and to upset the apple cart of of social order and you want and the other side that wants to maintain the conservatives they want to conserve the social order and it could be that it's good to have both of those keeping each other in check so that neither side goes too far hmm. and uh, so you know our, our current politics that always seems so uh, bellicose and so just hostile and angry and in fact I'm now old enough to know that there's really nothing new in in the current battles that it was always nasty it's always been nasty like that it was like that in the 60s with uh, Johnson and Nixon it was like that in the 1860s with Lincoln and what he had to go through to pass um, you know, the, the uh, abolitionist, uh, the, the amendment to ban slavery, sorry. Uh, I mean, it's always been that way. Maybe it always will be that way because of our human nature. Okay, that's a nice setting of the table because we're going to add another voice to our discussion now. In Oxford, England, via Skype, let's welcome Mark Linus to the program. He's an environmental activist and the author of The God Species, How the Planet Can Survive the Age of Humans. Mark, how are you doing all the way overseas? Good to have you on the program. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely fine. How are you? Terrific. I want to start by uh, just playing some tape of you. This was you at the Oxford Farming Conference in the United Kingdom last month. We'll play a clip and then come back and chat. Roll tape, please. I want to start with some apologies, which I believe are most appropriate to this audience. Um, for the record, here and up front, I want to apologize for having spent several years ripping up GM crops. I'm also sorry that I helped start the anti-GM movement back in the 90s and that I thereby assisted in demonizing an important technological option which can and should be used to benefit the environment. As an environmentalist and someone who believes that everyone in this world has a right to a healthy and nutritious diet of their choosing, I could not have chosen a more counterproductive path and I now regret it completely. So I guess you'll be wondering, following on from what Mike said, what happened between 1995 and now that made me not only change my mind, but actually come here and stand before you today and admit it? Well, the answer is fairly simple. I discovered science, and in the process, I hope, I'm becoming a better environmentalist. Now, of course, you're not talking about GM, uh, the car company. You are talking about genetically modified food there. And it was, I think... Um an astonishing thing for many people to hear those words coming out of your mouth, so I wonder what the reaction was to that speech. Uh, the reaction was immediate and very profound, uh, and, and it 
surprised me enormously. Uh, I mean, I made that speech just to a, a, a conference of 300 or so farmers in Oxford. Uh, this is a conference that happens every year. First, and it's been the, the first time I, I've been invited to speak to it. Um, and I just thought I'd tell the truth about how my views have evolved on this issue and, and share it with them. And in fact, there were probably some people in the audience whose crops I had destroyed during my sort of earlier career as an anti-GMO activist. And um, within literally just a matter of a couple of hours, the speech started going all around on, on Twitter and Facebook and basically went viral on the internet to the extent that it, it brought down my website that evening. And um, since then, that video, or at least the impressions of that video, have, have probably come, gone up to half a million or more. I've even stopped counting. So it was just one of those things that caught people's attention. I, I don't think it's because I'm particularly interesting. I think there's just a zeitgeist out there where people are ready for a change of, a change of heart on this issue in terms of you know what, what general public opinion is. Well, let's see if we can understand why that change of heart took place. Tell us why you were against genetically modified foods to begin with. Well, this was 15 or so years ago, um, back in about 1995, 96 was when I got involved in the issue. Um, and, and that's really when it began to hit the big time. I wouldn't claim credit for that. I was a, you know, a one participant amongst many in a movement which was essentially leaderless. And, um, you know, we did do um, direct action going out in the middle of the night and destroying crops. We did some, some of that kind of things in the daytime as well with a lot of media coverage and a lot, and a lot of press attention. And it was also quite a remarkable coalition of, of kind of the right and the left, um, to, to, to go back to your previous discussion. And so on the right, we had the tabloid newspapers talking about frankenfoods. And on the left, we had um, the environmental movement worrying about big corporations and, and the patenting of life. So it was one of those things that kind of caused a perfect storm and was incredibly successful, I would say. And I did say it was the most successful campaign I've ever been involved with. Uh, it's just a shame that it was focused, that it was pretty much anti-science and it was focused on doing the wrong thing. And I think in retrospect, it's done harm. But you know, and, and that this is an important technology which can be used for the good of the environment. But I didn't know that at the time, and uh, you know, I've changed my mind because uh, facts that I've seen them as have, have changed as well. Well, help us understand that. What what were some of the most important facts that helped your thinking evolve on this issue? Well, back then we didn't know whether GMOs would be safe or not, um, and so you can now say that something like two to three trillion meals uh, have, have been eaten now containing genetically modified organisms of one way or another. And there's been no substantiated case of harm at all. So in, in that sense, it's safer than organic food, where, of course, there have been uh, various outbreaks of bacterial contamination, which are traced to the organic food chain. Um, so I think it's time we got a better sense of risk and benefit for this. Um, also, the news is in pretty strongly that uh, where GM crops have been deployed, um, even where they've increased herbicide use in certain areas, they've decreased insecticide use. And so overall, the amount of toxins that are being put on farmland are quite radically down. They also allow the increased use of no-till farming, which is good for carbon and water retention in the soil. Um, and there's a lot of GMOs in the pipeline, which can increase nitrogen use efficiency and also being developed in the public sector. So to get away from the big corporations aspect here, uh, food fortification, which can be really useful to poorer people who are lacking micronutrients. Um, so um, this, is, this, is, this really seems to me to be a very important technology for food security as well as for environmental protection when we're going forward to a world with now 7 billion and, and soon to be 9.5 or so billion people by mid-century. So my point really is we can't foreclose any technological options which could be useful, certainly not on the basis of, of the kind of misinformation which I was involved in spreading 15 years ago. So if I understand you, you have simply followed the facts. The facts have changed and so your thinking has changed as well. And I wonder, as you have tried to explain that new viewpoint to some of your colleagues from the old days, who you may have been on those direct action campaigns with, how have they reacted to this? Um, people have reacted in a variety of ways, it's safe to say. There's been some negative reactions from people um, who, who I was involved with then. Uh, a lot of them still don't want to speak publicly. Um, what's really interested me actually is the reaction I've had from scientists, uh, many, many of whom are quite well known around the world, the top people in molecular biology who uh, many of them emailed me straight after that and said, I don't know why you're getting all this attention because we've been saying this for 10, 15 years, um, which was one thing which was interesting. And also people said, if you're getting a bag full of hate mail, that's welcome to my world. We've been also experiencing this for a very long time. Um, but, you know, I, I think I think there is a change of opinion here globally. And I watched, I watched my speech go around the world um, in different languages in Argentina in Chile and Australia and all sorts of the all sorts of places huge amounts of media coverage and, and very positive and I think actually 
people have realized that it's a bit like the anti-vaccine movement, that there wasn't the science underpinning the concerns about, about um, GMOs, uh, and that a lot of it has been shown to be false in retrospect, and that it is doing harm because it's precluding the use of an important technology. Um, and the test, I think, for the environmental movement and for, for many of us out there is whether we can change our minds now that we now that we know the facts on this issue and whether we you know whether, whether our facts can our our mental um, frames can actually accommodate science on this issue so that's genetically modified organisms i wonder if there are any other issues in the scientific realm that you once had a position on you have heard some new facts and therefore you have changed your views on that also anything else well certainly i've changed my views on nuclear power um, but that's more in response to the increasing urgency of climate change. And I've written two books on climate change, uh, really trying to bring awareness to the issue. And I started work on this way back in 2000. Uh, the most recent one I wrote was called Six Degrees, and that was published in 2007, 2008. And, you know, we, we simply can't solve this problem with the technology prescription which is put out there by most people who are concerned about it, you know, the Al Gore's of this world, who say that we can... Do all you know? Provide all the energy we need with just wind and solar and efficiency. And frankly, that's delusional. You know, I'm a big supporter of wind and solar, but they're less than one percent of global energy at the moment. We're not going to bring them up to eighty to a hundred percent without a, a lot more low carbon energy coming from other sources. Um, hydroelectricity can be part of that, but the only one that's just really scalable uh, and can be deployed to the kind of um, enormous amounts of energy generation that we need is nuclear. And it's also relatively environmentally benign, uh, again, contrary to most people's perceptions on this. Hmm. Okay, just finally, before I get Michael Sherman to make a, a comment on all of what he's just heard, uh, you heard him talk about the strains of anti-science on the left, and you'll forgive the pun, but is he right about the left in what he says? Um, from my perspective, I don't see it so much as a left-right issue. We don't have the sort of same Republicans, Democrats thing here. Um, the, the political right is, you know, certainly in terms of the Conservative Party here in the UK, um, is, is, is strongly in favour of dealing with climate change. And so there's no denial. There's not much denialism, although it does tend to be more of a creature of the, of the, of the right um, in, in the way that he, he identifies. But yes, I think left and right or envir environmentalists and non-environmentalists have got things wrong here, and I think both need to be challenged. The problem often is that environmentalists are quite self-righteous, and I I've, uh, have fallen into that trap too, um, in terms of um, taking the moral high ground. And it, once you've done that, and, and then you find out that you're wrong, it's actually more difficult to back down, perhaps, than, than, than a more humble position to start with. Michael Shermer, you've been listening to this discussion. Uh, what's your view on what you've just heard about the evolution of Mark's views? Uh, well, first of all, Mark, congratulations for making a, a switch like that. That takes a lot of intellectual courage. Uh, I happen to agree with you, but even somebody who doesn't agree with you has at least got to acknowledge that, to the best of your knowledge, you made the switch because of data, because of science, and that's re really what science is all about. It's, it is changing your mind when there is new evidence, and, and I, I think that takes a lot of intellectual courage. Almost nobody does that. Very hard for any of us to do that. Uh, another thought I had, um, I mentioned earlier Jonathan Haidt's uh, five moral foundations. One of his five is purity and sanctity, which on the Republican side of things, conservative side of things, it usually deals with the human body, the purity and sanctity of, of sex and, and don't drink too much, don't smoke, don't carouse, and, and so forth. And, um, and that's considered to be sort of a religious, spiritual kind of purity and sanctity. But I see it on the left as well, that the environment, the air, the water, the food, there's this sort of uh, almost uh, at same levels of conservatives on the left of of this concern for purity and sanctity of the of the natural environment and I mean on, on the one hand who wouldn't be in favor of cleaner air and cleaner water and so forth but on the other hand there's seven billion of us and so instead of a kind of subtle let's go back to Paleolithic days of hunter-gatherers where we lived in eco-harmony with the environment, which was never true anyway. Um, let's go forward and see what we can do technologically, scientifically, politically and economically to solve these problems uh, rather than just being you know, against them all across the board. Uh, with, with each of the different uh, energy sources that Mark was just talking about, um, you know, wind and, and solar and, and um, you, you know, hydroelectric electric, nuclear, and so forth, they all have downsides. It's not hard to find a study here or there that says, well, it's bad because of this or it's bad because of that. 
The question is, what's the overall balance of things? And in my view, the, the science shows that overall things have been getting a lot better over the last half century, and I don't know why environmentalists on the left don't take credit for that. I mean, they really launched the environmental movement that that really has should be given credit for a lot of these changes. And I think it might it might in part be an artifact of, of just, I hate to sound crude about it, but fundraising. If you want to raise money for your nonprofit, you can't say things are getting better and, and you know we don't need your help as much. You always have to wave the red meat and say, you know, things are bad and getting worse and we need you to dig deep into your pockets, get that checkbook out. Because hmm. those enemy on the right, they're trying to, you know, ruin the environment, and, and you know they hate they hate the they hate the natural environment and so on. Uh, but but in fact, things really are much much better than they were half a century ago. Okay, Michael and Mark, stand by one second because we're going to bring one more voice into our discussion. On the line now in Washington D.C. is Chris Mooney. He's a science journalist and the author of The Republican Brain: The Science of Why They Deny Science and Reality. And Chris, we welcome you to TVO tonight. And I wonder if you could start by telling us, you've written a couple of books actually about uh, the right wing views on science. How would you characterize those views just for starters? Uh, well, in the United States now especially, we have really systematic conservative denial of science. And it isn't just science, it is reality. Uh, I've listened a lot to what's been said so far. And uh, I, I agree that there are many problems on the left and GMOs are certainly a good example. So it is true that on the left you find some denial of science. However, on the right it's much more monolithic and in fact the data you put up uh, actually showed that, partly showed that. Uh, there's data that hasn't been talked about. Uh, for, for instance, the sociologist Gordon Goshat published a study in the American Sociological Review about a year ago where he looked at polling data from the General so Social Survey about trust in science. And he broke the data down by liberal, moderate, and conservative. This is U.S. data. And found that conservatives had dropped a lot in how much they trust science. And they were much lower than liberals and lower than moderates who had not dropped over a 30-year time period. So it isn't the case that uh, both sides are doing it. Uh, it is the case that you get some on both sides, but it's much more monolithic on the right, it's much more serious on the right. And so I could take issue, I like Michael Shermer a lot, but I could take issue with a lot of the things that he said. And actually also his interpretations of Jonathan Haidt's research, which I'd be glad to talk about. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, we recall a conversation with Melanie Goodchild about what science can learn from indigenous knowledge systems. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.